let's pray. Lord God, may you bless the people who listen to your word this morning, and even those who don't have the opportunity to listen to your word. Lord God, open our hearts to receive and practice your word. May your word this morning be a blessing and change our lives positively forever. We ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our passage this morning comes from Genesis 9, 8 to 17. Listen to the word of God. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and the descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you. The birds, domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you as many as came out of, the, out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth, God said. This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all future generations, I have set my bow, my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow, is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. For this morning comes from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 9. <clears throat> Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling bright, such as no one on earth could brighten them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us set up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son. The beloved, listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good to have you all here with us this morning. We've got a bunch of folks at home um, for various reasons, I'm sure, and we are glad that you guys are joining us as well from home. <clears throat> 
So today is Transfiguration Sunday. It's not exactly one of your top five Christian holidays. It might not be on your list at all when you think about Christian special days in the church. Transfiguration Sunday is always the Sunday just before Lent begins. Remember that Lent is a journey to Jerusalem. It goes over five Sundays. It's a journey to the cross and a journey then ultimately to the resurrection. Kind of like Advent is a journey to Bethlehem and the birth of Jesus. The transfiguration was up on a mountain. Matter of fact, I think it says a high mountain. And it is a real turning point in the ministry of Jesus. It's almost like, so here's the mountain. Here he's going along, healing, teaching, healing, teaching, spending time with disciples, goes up a mountain, and when he comes back down the other side, he's headed to Jerusalem for sure and certain death. So it's a turning point in the trajectory of his ministry. He's moving now toward, after this, he's moving toward the culmination of his ministry on earth. So we're focusing on that turning point today, the transfiguration, and Wednesday, we begin our journey toward Jerusalem with Ash Wednesday. Transfiguration sometimes gets um, uh, replaced or you, you do either, wor either word with transformation, transfiguration, transformation, but I find that there's a little bit of a difference, and you see if you might agree with this. Jesus was transfigured. His outward appearance had noticeably changed. Right in front of the eyes of the disciples who had hiked up that big mountain with him, he was all of a sudden shining like a light from a lighthouse. He no longer looked the same, but truly he was no different on the inside. He is still Jesus. He is still the Messiah. He is still the beloved Son of God. He looks different on the outside. Transformation is what happens to those disciples who were gathered there as they witnessed the amazing, shining Jesus. Jesus shining like an advertisement for bleach. And the mysterious presence there on the mountain of two of the greatest prophets in Israel's history, Moses and Elijah. The disciples' eyes are opened to a whole new understanding of this rabbi that they'd been following around. When they see those two historical figures, guys who have been long dead, standing there talking with Jesus, they make a connection between the ministries of Moses and Elijah and the ministry of Jesus. And then they hear the voice, and Jesus is on audible speaking terms with God. They all three saw the same thing. They all three heard the same thing. Peter, James, and John's image of Jesus was transformed, changing their relationship with him from this point onward. So not only is this a turning point in Jesus' ministry, it becomes a turning point for those three disciples and maybe the rest of them when they told them the story. Now, it's natural for us to read this story and say, how do we understand it? Why is Jesus transfigured? What does all of this mean, this event up on the mountain? And the truth is, we really can't fully understand it. 
it's a supernatural one-time occurrence. It's an epiphany, which is an eye-opening. An epiphany in the sense that Jesus is revealed more directly to those three disciples, even though Jesus didn't say a word on top of that mountain. They can now see clearly that he's more than a rabbi. He's more than a healer. He's more than someone who the evil spirits will listen to. Think about the bush that Moses saw. Remember that? That bush that was on fire, but it was not consumed by the fire? Could he explain it? Why did God speak to him through a burning bush? It's through that voice that Moses heard that he's called from caring for sheep in the wilderness to leading the people of Israel to freedom from slavery. Think about the fire that Elijah called down to burn the sacrifice in his public competition with the pagan prophets. Perhaps you remember that story. They both set up uh, basically a pyre, I guess you would say, with wood, and in order to burn a sacrifice to their gods, they poured water all over the wood, and Elijah called for God to light the fire. God's power shines through Elijah when the flames come and the sacrifice is offered, and the prophets on the other side did nothing. God's ability to be unmistakably visible, shining into the world, was something that Moses understood and Elijah understood. Both of them received a message that their God required commitment, that their God empowers and emboldens them to stand up to enslavement and oppression in the case of Moses, and to stand up and show pagan worshipers who God really is in the case of Elijah. Now, I would love to have listened to the conversation between Peter, James, and John when they walked down the other side of the mountain. Were they popping question after question to Jesus, trying to figure out what had they just seen and heard up there? Or were they lagging behind Jesus on the trail and wondering among themselves so he couldn't hear them? Maybe they didn't want to seem like they didn't get it. Or maybe they just changed the subject completely and they acted as if nothing unusual had happened up there. What do you think you would do? You've just seen two dead guys talking with Jesus who has totally changed his appearance and you heard God's voice identify Jesus as his son. What would be your reaction? I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand and tell us what would be your reaction if you had just witnessed and heard something like that. Just shout it out, and I'll repeat it for people at home. Shocking. shocking. Yeah, shocking. Mm-hmm, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh huh. I'd want to make sure somebody else saw it besides me so they don't think I'm off my rocker, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. Anybody else? You would be scared, which they were. Yes, I didn't mention that, but that was in the scripture that they were scared. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Not something you see every day, right? Or any day. Mm hmm. Yeah. I wonder how those disciples, Peter, James, and John, will be different after they come back down the mountain. 
Will they do anything differently? Will they tell their fellow disciples, even though Jesus tells them to keep it quiet? How could you keep that quiet? Will they start to listen more carefully when Jesus speaks? Since the voice from the cloud instructed them to listen to him. Will they really try to understand when Jesus describes his approaching death yet again? And it comes several more times. Will they see this experience as a sign? A sign that Jesus really is the Son of God. Standing on the shoulders of the great prophets Will they become, do you think, more confident? Will they become more trusting? Will they become surer that Jesus is who he says he is? Maybe all of those things might happen. The transfiguration was not just a sign. It was a neon sign, right? Brilliant, shining, that they could not miss. In the dark of the night, you see a neon sign. You can't miss it. It's attracted out of the side of your eye, the peripheral edge of your eye as you're driving. Witnessing this neon sign had to transform those disciples, had to change them, change their way of looking at who Jesus is and what their relationship is with him. Have you ever thought about the rainbow as another neon sign from God? Rainbows are visible to our eyes when the sun shines over a droplet of rain at a certain angle. Remember the covenant with Noah, which we heard this morning from the book of Genesis. After the flood waters had receded, after the earth had basically been destroyed except for the human and animal inhabitants of that big ark. In the short passage from Genesis, we heard this morning, seven times God repeats, using a few different words each time, but seven times God repeats to Noah, I will establish my covenant with you. Never again will I send floods to destroy the earth. I will establish my covenant with you and all the earth. I will establish an everlasting covenant with all creatures. God's promises that this will be the last and the only time that God will unleash a flood to destroy all living things. The sign of the promise of that covenant, he says, will be a bow in the clouds. God says to Noah, every time you see that bow, remember my promise to you. Remember my covenant with you. Don't forget, I'm making a covenant. I'm making a promise with you all. I'll never forget one of the most difficult funerals I ever participated in. It was held in a large church in our New Jersey town because the family knew that the crowd would be very large. It was a funeral for a teenage girl who lived around the corner from us who had died in a car accident when her mother was driving the car. It was so very sad for the entire community as they tried to offer comfort to this family. When we walked out of the church after that funeral service, we saw a rainbow in the sky. It was a sign of hope. 
like that sign promised to Noah, it reminded us in this sad, sad time of God's promises. It was a sign shining into the darkness of our souls that God was with us still, including the devastated mother. Well, maybe that's the whole purpose of this supernatural epiphany on the mountain. God's sending a sign that can't be ignored. God's changing the trajectory of Jesus' ministry from this point on, directing him toward Jerusalem. This Jesus is not just a local teacher. He's not even an earthly miracle worker only. He's God's son, and that means he is God. Without the understanding of who he is, what value and meaning would the crucifixion have to the community? If he's not God's son, then he's simply a human being who is killed because of trumped-up charges against him from those who feel threatened by him. Surely this is a sign up there on the mountain for Peter, James, and John, and ultimately for the rest of the disciples and anyone else they told their story to. They're taken aback. They're shocked. They're afraid. They're amazed. They're thinking they're crazy when they see those two long-dead prophets. Peter is so freaked out that he can't think what to say. And he's not usually one of those people who has trouble saying something. He stammers, I'm sure. He stammers out, well, how about if we make three tents for you all? One for each of you. The tent or the booth would have been places to identify and honor the presence of God that they felt like they were seeing right there. Kind of like that tent of meeting in the days of when Israel was on the move through the wilderness and didn't have an established place of worship. They're in the wilderness, right? They're up on the top of a mountain. The only thing Peter can think of on the fly is to create a booth or a tent, maybe out of sticks, maybe out of one of their cloaks, because God's right here, he sees. No one takes him up on that offer. Did you notice in the story? Turns out it was totally unnecessary to offer to build these tents because the voice from the cloud interrupted Peter's plan, and then suddenly Moses and Elijah are gone. No need for a tent. Is this transfiguration of Jesus and this transformation of these three disciples a sign for you and for me? Is it a sign some 2,000 years later? Is it a sign that we should not ignore this supernatural one-time event is like a window into greater understanding of who Jesus really is? It's a sign that God is orchestrating the whole thing starting with his baptism by John in the River Jordan. Remember, there was a voice there speaking to Jesus alone. You are my son. And now the voice is speaking so all of them can hear it there on top of the mountain. This is my son. That's not something they're going to forget. I hope it's not something that we will forget. I hope that it's a sign for us to listen up, to pay attention. 
I hope that Jesus' appearance in whatever form we might find him will transform us, will change our understanding of our relationship with him in some way. After all, he is effectively a neon sign from God, a message of life for us all. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing with 190. It is the story of this transfiguration, if you pay attention to the words. <laughs> 